without further ado, we're going to have each panelist speak about the different things that they've been doing to help us to have good medical care during this crisis. Good evening. It's a pleasure to actually be here to talk with you. Uh, I know, as all of us do, that this has been a difficult um, issue for the community and specifically for the medical people. Um, I am a medical doctor. I uh, have done mostly administrative work in my career. Uh, one of those positions was one of the people who started St. Francis West back when it first opened its doors. And I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience and it's really good to see you all. Um, so my connection with the hospital goes way back and um, my connection with St. Francis even farther. So this has been particularly distressing and um, I've been trying to stay connected and trying to, um, to work to help in any way that I could. Now I am the Deputy Director of Health. The Department of Health is part of the state, but we're not the same as the state. So a lot of things that I've heard, like from the Attorney General's office, will be secondhand. And if I have to relay some of that, I will qualify it because it, I'm, I'm going to do it um, secondhand, which is never the same. Um, I do wish to thank Representative Pine for um, putting this on. This is a valuable service, and it, it can't be minimized. Um, we probably should have had more of these kinds of sessions, not just with Kapolei, but with the other communities directly affected by the events that have happened. Um, I'll, I'll just start, and this is all going to be very um, brief. Um, we will be here and we'll be talking for a lot longer. A lot of the people on the panel are the people who are directly involved, and I'm not going to speak for them. So very briefly then, when we found out about the um, imminent bankruptcy, there were four issues basically that we were confronting. One was the patients that were in the hospital. We had to make sure that they all found uh, appropriate um, uh, accommodations and other facilities. And frankly, we didn't have to do anything at the state. Uh, the private sector stepped up big time. Um, facilities that normally don't take patients from this part of the island um, opened their doors, and we are very, very grateful to them. The second issue um, are the, it's the transplant program, which was unique to St. Francis. It started back in the 70s, I believe, and has been part of the culture at St. Francis, and to see that go was a, a major uh, factor. Um, as you've probably seen in the paper, transplants, um, it is a unique program that's only done at St. Francis, and if they can't get the service in Hawaii, the only alternative is to go to the mainland, which uh, is, it comes at great expense and great uh, difficulty to the families and to the patients. The third issue is the emergency department. Um, response times and basic ability to handle the, um, the change from the closures of the facilities. And Jim is going to talk to you about that, so I'm not going to go into the details. Our issue mostly with the emergency department was to monitor the response times and the um, actual transports times and to look at the, um, at the outcomes. And finally, number four was the actual disposition of the hospital itself. So that will be discussed as we move forward. Okay, so next speaker uh, from the City and County of Honolulu, Department of Emergency Management, Dr. James Ireland. Thank you, uh, Representative Pine. <clears throat> Thank you for, for being here tonight. I um, oversee the ambulance services in um, the City and County of Honolulu. And even though um, I practiced in this community and, and, and knew all the doctors at HMC West and many at Polymomi and Wahiwa. I, I too was surprised by how quickly this happened and how little notice um, really everybody had um, to react. And when I found out um, um, from Dr. Kelly, it was a Friday in, in December, um, I had an immediate uh, meeting with Mayor Carlisle and we knew that the um, 
closure would have an immediate effect on, on patients here. And we uh, put additional ambulances uh, in service, including um, West Oahu. And we predicted correctly that with the closure of this hospital, um, ambulances from Waianae, Nanakuli, Makakilo, Waipahu, Waipio, uh, would no longer be able to go to the west. And what would happen before is they would go to the west, drop off their patients, and they'd be available again, and they'd be still basically in the community. But now they had to go further. They had to go to Wahiwa, they had to go to Palimomi. And as those, um, patient, those hospitals got more and more patients that once went to the west, um, they very quickly became full, and at times too full to even handle more ambulance patients. And so then, then the next step was to go a little further, and the ambulances would then go to um, Tripler and to Kaiser. And those two institutions were very gracious in accepting patients that didn't normally go there. They weren't Kaiser members or they weren't in the military. But as those two facilities became at times overwhelmed, the ambulances would go even further. They would go to Kuakini, they would go to Straub, and they would go to Queens. Um, and in some cases, even to Castle, if you can believe that. Um, and so we knew that as these ambulances went further out of their area, we would have to uh, staff additional ambulances to cover um, the community while their home-based ambulance was you know, somewhere else on the island transporting a patient. And, and that's what we did, and our response times um, have uh, remained uh, the same or slightly better um, across the island, including West Oahu. And we're very proud of that and very proud of our team in EMS um, that's provided the safety net for the community. And we still encourage people um, even more so to call 911 in emergencies because if it's a tr you know, true emergency, um, we can get there very quickly and get you to the most appropriate hospital. Now what's happened though is as some of these hospitals have become full, um, they've gone on what's called reroute and this changes from day to day and hour to hour but you may not get to the hospital you want to get to. Um, you know, if your doctor's at Wahiwa, if they're on reroute, you know, we can't go there. If Polymomi's on reroute or Tripler or Kaiser or any of the others, we have to go to the hospital that can have the resources to provide care. And that's been a little challenging, but it's been very doable. And what I've been very um, pleased about in, in this situation is that our community partners, including all the hospitals, the health department, the state, the city, uh, urgent care centers like Pearl City Urgent Care, everybody has come together and really, um, I think, mitigated what could have been a very, very bad situation. Um, it's still not ideal, but I think working together closely with all our partners, we've, um, I think, done the best in, a, in an otherwise not so great situation. Um, in the long term, my hope, I think, with everyone else is we get a um, local, respected, uh, healthcare provider to reestablish the West as a hospital. Uh, but I think realistically, I, um, and you know, this is just for me speaking personally, I don't think it's going to happen um, in the next few months, but you know, maybe, maybe hopefully within a year. Um, but I think the others can speak you know, more to that subject. Um, but from, again, from the EMS standpoint, we have extra units on. We're, we're committed to this community. Um, our long-term strategic plan has an, an additional ambulance permanently in Eva Beach, um, you know, hopefully within the next um, one to two years. And, uh, you know, this community is a growing community. It's important, just like every other community on Oahu. And from the city standpoint, um, you know, we want to make sure we're the safety net for emergencies. Thank you. Um, for you, those of you who don't know me, I'm Melanie Kelly. I'm an ER and internal medicine physician that's worked in this community for 25 years. Um, I had been the medical director at HMC, and even before the closure of HMC, um, we had started the urgent care at Pearl City, um, mainly because working in the emergency room, I could see that a fourth to a half of these patients that would come in could be serviced in a different venue. In fact, I was watching a healthcare reform debate a couple of years ago, and the topic was um, centered around the fact that they believed you couldn't improve the system to make it cheaper, faster, with higher quality. You couldn't have all three of those uh, things 
uh, happening at once. You could only choose two of those things at any one time. And I thought, well, why is that true? Why doesn't somebody think outside the box and come up with something better? And actually somebody did. The uh, first minute clinics opened in the mainland and they won an innovation in healthcare award back in Connecticut in 2002 because these clinics would supplement the, uh, the emergency rooms and the PCP services such that more people would have access and they were cheaper. Um, if you look at the slide, you can see that the average ER charge is $830 for the patient and for insurers. And um, when you go to an urgent care, the average charge is $250. And that seems to hold true in Hawaii as well. Um, at our urgent care, we do have special plans for the uninsured. We make it affordable. We offer payment plans, et cetera. And we do have special rates for our friends who were formerly at HMC. We also have wait times that are very low. Um, the average urgent care patient is tr treated within 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and we strive to have the highest quality health care provision. Um, we just want to try to ease the burden on the PCPs and the ERs. So who, sh who should come to us? We do not pretend to be an emergency room. We do not pretend that we can take care of the acute strokes, the heart attacks, people who have major injuries. But there is a whole slew of conditions that we can treat very efficiently. And we are not trying to be PCPs. We want to work with your PCP to provide the best health care possible. Good evening. I'm Jen Chahanovich, and I'm very happy to be here. And um, we are very saddened at Hawaii Pacific Health with the closures of HMC both agencies, and since the closures, we have seen an increase. Um, Kapiolani Medical Center at Women and Children in Straub Clinic and Hospital seen about a 10% increase in their ED visits, and Polymomi Medical Center, where I'm the Chief Operating Officer, we've seen about 28% increase. What we've done to help deal with that and to be there for the community 24-7, we're there for you, and we understand the anxiety that everyone's feeling with the closures. We have something called Team Triage, and we've been doing that now for about three years, and that's where our ED physicians, um, about 12 hours a day during the peak um, busy times in the emergency room, they're actually the ones triaging the patients versus a nurse. So when you're coming in, you're seeing an ED physician, and that helps with the flow. What we've done since the closure is we've had a um, space that we've opened for an overflow where we can see the lower acuity patients that come in so we can speed up that process. Um, we've also added 12 inpatient beds. We had um, suites in our um, hospital and we have added 12 beds to that area so we can have what we call, it's an overflow where you're waiting for an inpatient bed because at times we are full, just like Dr. Ireland said. We also have a process where we can transfer um, medically stable patients to other um, hospitals in town when we are full. Our cardiac cath lab, we are the only interventional cardiac cath lab on this side, and we have a dedicated team of physicians, so it's a different team than our ED physicians. So the um, ambulance, EMS, they do bring those um, heart attack patients to polymomy. We also, coming in July, we're adding a new women's center, our women's center that has been in the community for years on campus. We're moving it off um, to the old Inspiration Building at Pearl Ridge Mall. That will give us additional space on our campus to see patients. We're also adding a second MRI. And just to note, we're not just busy in the emergency rooms at our hospitals. We're seeing all the increases. We know there's more than just emergencies. Um, we had chemotherapy patients that were um, need infusion. We've seen an increase in infusions. Um, but what we've done to help alleviate this too, and in our imaging department, we've also seen a big increase. We've added staff. Um, to date, we have about 98 um, HMC employees that we have hired throughout Hawaii Pacific Health. Um, we have 60 in the pipeline. So. Not only will, do we want to be there for the health care needs of this community, and I live on this side, so I totally understand what we need 
on um, Leeward Coast and, and West Oahu. We also want to be there for the employees. Um, Kapilani Medical Center at Women's and Children, they're looking at the pediatric um, transplant for bone marrow. So we are there for the community and we do understand. I want to share with you a little bit about the mission of uh, Tripler Army Medical Center. And we're a community hospital. We have um, approximately um, 200 to 230 beds with an average census of about 180. Um, in addition to that, we're a training center. We have graduate medical education. We provide services to active duty service members, their families, retired military personnel, and veterans. In addition to that, we provide all the services necessary for deployment for the 25th Infantry Division, which is at Schofield Barracks. We are also the tertiary referral center for the entire Pacific to include forward deployed um, service members in Guam, um, Japan, and Korea. We deliver babies, we do surgeries, both open heart, um, all types of surgeries, and in addition to all that, at any given time, between 10 and 20 percent of our personnel are forward deployed. So we're a community hospital, we're a training hospital, we're a hospital for readiness, we're a tertiary referral center for the Pacific. We're the Veterans Hospital, and we provide services to our active duty service members and their families. And we're part of the community. We, we, we live among you. And um, many of our service members are blessed to live in the leeward side. In this time of need, and always, people ask me, well, what about civilian care? Well. When, when the hospitals in town are on divert, there is no place to go because they're full. Um, we accept civilian emergencies. And our goal there is to stabilize the patients. And once they're stabilized, then refer them to another of the community hospitals. Once in a while, there's no place to go and we admit the patients to the hospital. So that's been uh, a mission that has been part of Tripler for many, many years. And what is now is different is we're in the process of standing up a trauma center. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let um, Colonel Edwards if, uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, our initiative. Thank you, Captain Acosta. Uh, I am the trauma director at uh, Triple Army Medical Center, and it is my pleasure to start standing up a trauma center. Um, it's been my mission since I graduated from the uh, University of Hawaii uh, Queens uh, program to start having this uh, movement towards a trauma center where we take care of uh, civilians. It's also been my desire as uh, I've deployed several times to Afghanistan to keep and train those people and skills that we learn in combat to continue to utilize them here at the hospital uh, at Tripler. And in so doing, um, that's the plan and direction that we're going with the uh, trauma center that we uh, are moving at Tripler. Um, I think it's also important, it's my honor to be out here serving in Hawaii, is to let you realize that 10% of the population generally is a beneficiary of uh, Tripler Army Medical Center. And so even though they might not be wearing a uniform, there's a great number of people who do uh, and are able to come, you know, right there. And it's been my direct mission, if those people are injured, that we do take them and receive them at Tripler in this time, especially. Thanks a lot. Uh, Tripper, as probably all the hospitals are, are constantly seeing turnover, and we're always hiring medical professionals. Uh, the number and, and the skill sets that we're looking for change on a daily basis, uh, and they're all handled uh, through the civil service system of, of the United States government. So there's veterans preference and, and some other activities that we all have to deal with. Uh, but it's a very easy process. Um, go through a web-based program on something called USA Jobs and can put your resume in whatever form, your CV or whatever it may be into that system uh, and we'll get it to the right departments in the hospital and if there are vacancies, uh, uh, we're looking for people on a daily basis. Uh, I think just today we, uh, we approved the hiring of about nine nurses uh, 
in the hospital and those those job vacancies will be out in the next two weeks or so for those who are interested i'll have some handouts over here that explain how to apply and some representative job offers for you all thank you very much thank you mr cole i am danilo blan and i see a lot of familiar faces here i've been with the community i've been with saint francis from its inception 21 years ago yeah i'm here also here to represent the remaining physicians who have stayed in the facility at saint francis west we still have five active buildings in the facility we have the St. Francis Medical Plaza, where several subspecialties are still and will still serve the community. We have Dr. McMahon for uh, ophthalmology, we have Pierre Pang, we have our sleep lab, we have several surgeons there, Dr. Sima Franca and, uh, and Dr. Brunel. We have pediatric services. We have several internal medicine uh, and other specialties are still in the building. We have pediatric, we have uh, our podiatry specialist. And in the other building, we have the cancer center of uh, uh, being operated on. And of course, we have WorkStar injury uh, uh, recuperating center. Is that the right word, Dr. McCaffrey? We have uh, the St. Francis uh, Sullivan Hospice and have the dialysis center. So if you pass by St. Francis campus right now, the parking lot is full. Why? Because it's not only the hospital that, is, uh, that has been operating. We have several, at least 70 physicians are still there and I believe will still be there until uh, until the uh, until such time until we are not needed anymore, but I believe we will still be there indefinitely. So uh, I can see uh, Dr. McCaffrey here, the, who I'm supposed to represent. Uh, I wonder if you could say some words, Dr. McCaffrey. Thank you very much, Dr. Bond. I, I couldn't say it any better, really, except to to reassure the public here tonight and to all of the residents in the Leeward Plain that we do have 60 doctors still on campus at Hawaii Medical Center West, formerly St. Francis, and we're not going anywhere. Uh, we're here to serve the public, and we're standing strong. We've got very active and successful practices, and we welcome all of you on campus at any time. Now, I don't want to gloss this over, losing the hospital and the emergency department, which, by the way, Dr. Kelly down here was the, the chief of emergency medicine and, and spent years of service there. Um, I don't want to gloss that over. We're, hit, we're in a rough patch right now, and I want to applaud Representative Pine for putting this, uh, this panel together of individuals that represent institutions that are stepping up to the plate, and I want to applaud everyone that came tonight for your interest. But I also want you to know that although we're going through some rough times, we're very optimistic that either HPH, the Capiolani group of hospitals, or possibly Queens, or possibly another buyer will pick up the hospital and reopen the emergency department. Uh, that property is a jewel and a gem, and it's right in the middle of a beehive in this Capolet, the second city, and doggone it, we're gonna make that work. And to that end, uh, and taking the lead of Dr. Kelly, by the way, uh, we have plans right now to get an urgent care center open as quickly as possible. You know, this whole thing kind of caved in on everybody on Christmas Eve, December, so we're scrambling. We've got talented doctors such as Dr. Kelly, and she might even play a role. We're not sure yet, but we're going to dug on it. We're going to get an urgent care center open with x-ray. Uh, we've got the doctors with the knowledge. We just need the tools to do our trade, and we look forward to serving you in the future. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, it seems like Wahiwai would be out of the loop on this uh, to a large extent. However, it turns out we are not. Um, you know, we, we were surprised at how rapidly West closed as, as well, and, and we had to plan around its closure. Um, you know, we thought on the Friday when December the 16th when it was announced that 
you know, the emergency room was going to stay open a little bit longer, maybe a week or two, and just the ambulance services were going to be uh, <coughs> diverted or moved uh, to other facilities. And then we found out uh, Monday morning, it was, you know, Dr. Ireland called me early Monday morning, and he said, I'm standing in the emergency room at West, and the lights are out, and it's closed. And there's no one here. And I said, oh, boy, that really changes how we need to, you know, address planning for what's going to happen because we originally thought it would be primarily the ambulance services and that they would be, you know, moved to the other uh, hospitals at Palimomi and Wahiwai on into town. And, and that was, um, you know, per the uh, discussions we had with Hawaii Medical Centers, they had said it was 70 to 90 patients per day that were, you know, going to the emergency room at West. Well, we talked to our emergency physicians and we talked to all of our staff at the hospital and we started the planning process to you know, adapt you know, to the new inflow of patients and we had a fairly large uh, inflow. The, you know, the total number of emergency visits we had you know, increased by about 20% on the average, uh, but you know, the ambulance visits increased by 20% as well. Uh, our acute census uh, doubled in the hospital. So I think on a percentage basis, we may have been impacted uh, as much as anyone else, okay, in the whole network between here and, uh, and Honolulu. Uh, I think that, you know, the thing that I would like to convey to uh, all of you here, I guess that, you know, if you, you know, are going down H1 and you need to, you know, seek emergency services, Wahiwa well, is not a bad place to go to. We have the emergency physicians there who are all board certified. Uh, our ER doctors practice at uh, Castle, uh, Hilo, and North Hawaii Community Hospital, uh, and they've just recently gone over to Kuku and, and at Wahiwa. So they're, they're very well trained uh, ER physicians. Uh, we've got all the other emergency services that are needed to support the emergency, as far as diagnostic services and radiology and lab. Uh, we've got as good of radiology equipment as they have in you know, in the state of Hawaii. Uh, we have superb uh, laboratory services as well. So, you know, we still have uh, capacity to uh, handle more patients. Uh, not a lot, but we can handle more. So, I think, you know, for us, uh, we've tried to help, uh, and our staff has done a you know, superb job of um, adapting. And I think the emergency services group that, you know, that provide the emergency services, like you know, Dr. Ireland's group, I, they, they really need to be commended for the job they've done. I do want to tell you a couple of things that the legislature has done so far. And I'm really proud of my colleagues. They really rolled up their sleeves, and as soon as the legislature opened, they already knew that they had to rush a few bills through. And the first bill that we um, uh, did an emergency appropriation was to keep a transplant uh, center open. And so we rushed it through the House, we rushed it through the Senate, and the governor signed it immediately. And so we will continue to have a transplant center. We felt that that was the number one priority since what was happening was people were having to be flown to the mainland to get a transplant and, and, and they're already in an emergency situation. So that's the first thing that, that, that we did. We also have a bill going through uh, and, it, and it's doing very well and it most likely will get funded and that is to expand um, the funding or increase the funding for uh, uh, the, the, the ambulances. And the ambulance, and this answers one of these questions, uh, we're looking to locate it just down the street here in the Ella Beach area in the old fire station. And uh, so that's the plan for that funding. I believe it went through the House and now needs to go through the Senate and then hopefully to the governor's office, which we expect him to sign. Uh, just want to go into two questions. We're going to do a two-part question with Dr. Sakamoto. Uh, one, uh, when will the new transplant center open? And then two, uh, the biggest questions that I've had to me throughout this week was, have the response times for the ambulance been worse? Doctor? In terms of transplant, um, Queens Medical Center is going to be the um, facility from here forward. Um, they're um, in the process of getting accreditation from a national organization that oversees transplant services nationwide. 
Um, they do it one organ at a time, meaning liver, kidney, pancreas, heart, etc. They do them one at a time. The first one is going to be liver, and that's going to be in this month. Second one is going to be kidney, and that um, is scheduled for next month. Um, pancreas and heart will be down the road. Um, Kapilani Medical Center, as Jen said, uh, will continue to do bone marrow for our pediatric cases, and bone marrow for adult cases is still being discussed. So that's the current state of the art. Um, in terms of emergency, um, our ambulance response times, uh, the state keeps the data for that and the services are performed by the cities, city and counties. So we do it for all of the islands, um, the four counties, and uh, it's, it's a better system than having the people who deliver the services track their own data. Um, it turns out that because of the work that uh, Dr. Ireland and his staff are doing and the additional addition of, the, uh, of uh, other resources, the response times, which means the time um, from the start of the call to when the ambulance uh, gets to the scene, that's the response time. Um, the benchmark is 10 minutes, and we've maintained somewhere around 8.7. So it's been flat, meaning that's a good thing. They've been able to maintain the services as before. The baseline, um, and I'm saying it's when I say that it stays the same, is the previous six months uh, response times. So we call that the baseline, and it hasn't really changed. Now, what is a little longer is the actual transport time, uh, going from the scene of the accident to the hospitals, just because we've lost one of our facilities closer by and the hospitals just have, ambulances have to go a longer distance. So that would explain that. Um, but thus far, you know, due to the efforts of Dr. Ireland, Ireland and his staff, things are maintaining. Yeah, and they did mention in a meeting on Tuesday that there have been <coughs> no fatalities or negative effects to anyone's health um, due to um, the, their response times. And so I do want to thank you folks. It's really what you have, folks have done is uh, quite heroic. Uh, this question is for you, Dr. Kelly. And Dr. Kelly, there's two different questions relating to your facility. One, what type of insurance uh, do you carry? And uh, are you open 24 hours? There's three. Are you open 24 hours? And how do they know to come to your facility versus an, uh, uh, calling 911? Well, at the Pearl City Urgent Care, we don't uh, refuse anyone. If you come to us, we will take care of you. Um, we take all insurances. We take uninsured um, as well. Um, the only problem that we've had so far is that Kaiser doesn't have a have a um, contract with us. So we don't know if their people will get reimbursed for their care. Um, we are not open 24 hours a day. Uh, we're open seven to seven on the weekdays and on the weekends from eight to six. And for the third question, how to know when to come to their urgent care? Um, that's the more difficult question because you know it's a learning process for the community, I'm sure. So if, you're, if you have any doubt, if you're really in distress, call 911 and they'll help you sort that out. Um, if there is a question of whether you could possibly come to us, you can call us and we'll help you on the phone decide if it's appropriate. I, I know that a number of patients have been referred to us by the nurse hotlines, the, the Ask a Nurse lines for both Polymomi and Queens and uh, another, another service in the community. So in doubt, if when you're in doubt, you can call us and we'll let you know. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I had a lot of questions from the audience of what can you do to help to uh, reopen the hospital. How you can help me is I'm only one of 76 legislators and there's about maybe six of us or seven of us on the leeward coast. And as you can imagine, we're the ones that care about this side of the island the most. And we are fighting for these funds, just like everybody else throughout the state, someone's fighting for Molokai, for Maui, the Big Island, 
i hope that you signed in today because there are multiple bills moving to the legislature one was getting an ambulance stationed here twenty four hours just down the street from here we are going to need your support you can email or show up at the capitol and testify if you signed in today we will be alerting you when those bills are going to be heard in the house or senate committee and when it's on the governor's desk waiting for his signature also we have some emergency funds also for wahiawa hospital which is the closest to some of us right now that we're going to need your support i do want to talk about a new development that was released to the public today and it's through some hard work and negotiations with the department of health the department of health and the sisters of saint francis have entered negotiations for the state to partner with them to take over hawaii medical center east and what's going to happen there is what we realize we are losing um 145 million a year was it about 145 million a year in our long-term care losses that we provide for people and so what this situation has actually given to us is a new opportunity and we realized what we needed more than anything else was a long-term care facility and so that there's some bills going through the legislature right now that i just voted on i'll need your help on this as well to partner with the the sisters to open this facility to lower all of our health care costs that is really one of our biggest expenses right now also revealed were a couple of representatives one from queens medical center and one from hawaii pacific health did express a very strong interest in purchasing hawaii medical center west which is just up the street from here and they were very interested but what's going on now and i'm answering a couple questions all at one time is we have to wait for the bankruptcy process to go through and we don't know how long that will take but you need to understand that the governor senators and representatives are trying to not put pressure on them but expressing a strong desire and a need for this bankruptcy process to take place as soon as possible the representative from hawaii pacific health told us on tuesday that if they acquire the hospital they will do a lot of remodeling and this answers another question to to fix up the facilities and bring it up to date and but their number one priority is to open that emergency room immediately and so there is a lot of positive news this week that i can report to you and i'm, I'm very happy to do so uh, the next series of questions is for Captain Acosta. And I'm just going to do one at a time. I'm not going to do what I did Dr. Kelly. <laughs> um, and this is a very important one. And, and then I think uh, my husband being in the Navy that we're all kind of worried about. Uh, how will cuts in the defense budget affect, affect uh, military retirees and their spouses that have TRICARE Prime and use the military treatment centers? Will they be affected at all, do you know? So that's a tough one because I'm not a TRICARE specialist. Okay. So I can give you my perspective on, on, on our facilities and, and, and um, the care we provide. Uh, care for active duty and active duty service members and, um, should remain the same. Also for our beneficiaries should re remain the same. The question is how much will, they, will the, um, the premiums go up? But in terms of the, the services that, that they'll receive, they'll be the same, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, what will the premiums um, go up? And right now, and again, I'm, I'm not an expert, so, so don't quote me on this, but okay. Um, but I, I, they're still less. The services are the same or better, and the premiums are less than what they would normally pay for, um, for private insurance. This side of the island has a very large veterans population and military population. Um, what is the time frame for the opening of the Tripler uh, Trauma Center? That, that's a great question, I, and I, I appreciate you asking it. So the, the process is complex. And so we're talking about um, first 
changing how we practice at the hospital. So we have to get trained and um, get all the services ready to receive patients. Uh, the next thing is the, all the, the relationships and the memorandums of understanding with the state. And that takes time. So our plan is to first get trained our, train our people, which we are done. I'll go out on a limb and say we're done. Number two, our plan is to start taking the, our beneficiaries, trauma patients, first, while we work out the, all the memorandums of understanding with the state. What happens now is if you are one of our beneficiaries or active duty and you have a, say, a motor vehicle collision or you're involved in a motorcycle crash, and um, since we're not a trauma center, you, you will be taken, you'll go past Tripler downtown. And as we stand up our trauma center, we're going to start receiving those patients first. So those patients will come to us and that will open up space down at Queens. As we complete all the negotiations with the state, then we'll open up for, um, for civilian emergencies. And I, I can't give you a timeline. We hope that it, that's in the near future. That being said, today we receive civilian emergencies that are not trauma patients. Um, they can be patients who have heart attacks or strokes. And that happens when our partners downtown are full. And so that, that's not going to change. That continues today. And um, we have seen a slight increase of the number of patients that come under that rubric. But the trauma center, we're done with the training. We hope very soon to be receiving our beneficiaries and in the near future um, to then be open for the civilians. But just opening for our beneficiaries has a tremendous benefit because those patients now will be seen at Tripler and not take up the space downtown. Thank you so much. Um, uh, one for um, Mr. Olden regarding Wahiawa General Hospital. Yeah. Will Wahiawa General Hospital become another facility to provide emergency cardiac care? Well, That's short for a medical talk. Yeah, well, you know, we already see patients come into our hospital, okay, and you know, if they need to have additional uh, care, you know, then they'll be referred on or, or transferred to other hospitals in town. And, and generally, you know, they could be transferred to Palimomi, okay, but generally they're transferred to Queens, okay, uh, for, for things like that. What that question is referring to is a particular type of heart attack called a STEMI, and that stands for ST Elevation MI, and that's the most severe kind of heart attack. And the paramedics carry uh, EKG machines to diagnose those in the ambulance. And about a year, year and a half ago, we changed our guidelines that if you're having that type of heart attack, the ambulance will pass all other hospitals and go to a hospital that has a cardiac catheterization laboratory that's staffed 24 hours a day and can take that patient right away into the lab because studies have shown that if you take a patient with that type of heart attack into a cath lab and they open the artery up right away, it can save the heart and save the patient. And so right now, um, those protocols are in place. And for this side of the island, uh, Polymomi is the STEMI center. And so our ambulances, even before the closure, West was not a STEMI center, we would go to Polymomi. On the east side of Oahu, um, we would go to, um, now the east is closed now, so it would be Straub, Queens, or Kuakini. And, um, and I believe Kaiser and, and Tripler as well, if they're uh, members there. But uh, the ambulances from this side of the island uh, will go to Polymomi if the patient has a STEMI. Uh, who currently owns the, the medical center buildings at HMC East and West? And what is being done with the facilities right now? Is it just sitting there and is anyone maintaining it? Okay, uh, historical perspective. The uh, St. Francis uh, Medical Center West was uh, established for, uh, in uh, 1989. And uh, the building uh, is, was owned by the uh, St. Francis, St. Francis uh, Healthcare System. Sometime about uh, four years ago, the uh, a group of doctors and uh, 
our partners from Kansas uh, bought the uh, building, but not the land. So uh, this was uh, a partnership, and it resulted to Hawaii Medical Center. And this was also true with the St. Francis East facility. And we bought the building but not the land. So then, um, historically, again, uh, Representative Pine, during the first few months of our operation, we asked the legislator, legislation to uh, give us a reprieve of the GET tax for a year or two, but that was turned down. Actually, uh, so it, after a few years of operation, we just couldn't uh, we just couldn't uh, keep up with uh, with the low reimbursement. For every dollar, the facility was getting sixty cents uh, because of our number of uh, uninsured or low insurance, but. For the past 20 months before the closure, the St. Francis West was in the black. St. Francis West was profitable. So that uh, I'm sure our uh, members of the, uh, of the billing department who are here can attest to that. So bankruptcy was filed and after the bankruptcy, the building will go back to the St. Francis healthcare system, which is our biggest uh, uh, debtor. Uh, they own they own they own the mortgage, so they will they will assume uh, the, uh, the building and. That's when all the uh, all the negotiations probably will start with whoever buyer will be uh, interested with the building. Is anyone at the state level trying to reopen HMC West? And if so, how long does the approval of permits and licensees take once a buyer for the hospital is found? So basically, two questions help you. The First, the second one first, how long does the approval of permits and licenses, et cetera? Um, the state has two roles to play in terms of approvals and licenses. One is the certificate of need process that's administrated by the State Health Planning and Development Agency. And um, there, they have to um, meet 10 separate criteria that are set down in state statute back in the mid-70s. And it's a complicated process that normally takes um, 90 days. Uh, but in a case such as what we're facing with HMC West, there is something called an emergency certificate of need. And that can be done in a couple of weeks. So I would think that as long as the criteria are met, which there should be no problem whatsoever, um, this will not be the bottleneck. Uh, the second thing that the state does is to license our hospitals. Licensing includes inspections, mostly for quality issues. It's one thing to open a hospital, but we all want our hospitals to be really good. So um, they still, whoever opens the hospital will have to establish that they can meet the same criteria standards that all the other hospitals do. That's something that um, is not flexible. We want our hospitals to be good, period. Um, the first question, um, is anyone on the state level trying to reopen HMC West? And it seems like a straightforward question, but actually it is not. Um, so I will go through it at some level of detail, but I know it's gonna be boring and complicated. So just try to bear with me. You're gonna hear more about an organization called HHSC. 
they're going to be working with HMC East to determine if that can be opened under HHSC as a long-term care type facility. HHSC stands for Hawaii Health Services Corporation. They are a network of mostly neighbor island facilities that were at one time state-run facilities. That's their role. Um, some of you may remember that when Kahuku went bankrupt, HHSC took them over. Well, HHSC does our three major acute care hospitals on the neighbor islands, that would be Maui Memorial, Hilo Medical Center, and Kona Community Hospitals. <coughs> Those are substantial facilities, um, whereas Kahuku would fall into the category of uh, what is federally designated as critical access hospitals. These are very small rural hospitals. Um, so HH HHSC has taken most of them in their network. So it's the three neighbor island acute care hospitals and um, the critical access hospitals. The only one I believe that is not in their network is Molokai General. So Kahuku fits in very nicely because of the size of the facility and the fact that it's rural and meets the criteria for being a critical access hospital. The other thing that HHSC does is to manage uh, several long-term care facilities. The Ahi is one of them. Um, so long-term care in terms of what HMC East may become is something that fits in with their organization. Now, HHSC was formed in the late 90s as a vehicle to create a more efficient system, uh, lower cost, higher quality, for our neighbor island facilities mostly. And they are considered a private organization except for a couple things such as the employees are all state workers. So go figure. Um, the procurement process has to go through the state process. So everything they buy actually goes through the state process. All the employees are state workers and yet they're considered a private organization. So it's a complicated kind of mess. Um, but they have stepped up and said that we can do something with East. Now, the trouble is they don't have a whole lot of resources, um, AKA money. And as Jen noted, and as another um, representative of HPH noted, that to bring West up to speed in terms of modernization of equipment and improvement to its facilities. That would take somewhere around $20 million just to do that. Plus the purchase price, given the state's current budget, basically puts it out of reach. That's one thing. The other is that philosophically, if you agree or not, um, our healthcare system mostly is a private sector free enterprise business. We are one of the few in the entire world that has this type of healthcare delivery system. And it is being criticized because it is high cost. And our quality numbers in terms of our national data compared to other countries like Germany, Switzerland, France, uh, Japan, they all have better quality numbers than we do. Nevertheless, that is our system. So philosophically, we want the private sector to continue to run our hospitals. And basically, we don't feel we have the monies to take over um, West anyway. Now, is that the end of the road for that? Maybe not. Right now, because Queens and HPH, both private facilities, have stepped up and said they are very interested in West, we're going to stay out of it. And that's basically, given what I told you, an appropriate stance. But again, if everything falls apart and someone's got to do it, who knows?
the discussion is the capital is very much the same but if for some reason the hospital is not not bought we will take that very seriously and that's where the state will step back into the process but while there's interested buyers who know how to run medical centers we're going to do everything we can to speed up the bankruptcy process and their permits that are required as much as possible in terms of what a hospital needs to actually open it's the CON and a state license for sure but there's something called a medic a CMS Medicare Medicaid provider number so the federal government basically grants that and in order to get Medicare reimbursements or monies you have to have this provider number and that will take months now two days ago a representative from HPH and Jen can chime in on this said that they really will open the hospital if they can before they even get the provider number so that's a big deal so we really do hope that we can really get something going through one of the two facilities but that provider number piece can take a long time so that's actually the bigger bottleneck however what was mentioned though even though it may take a while to open the hospital that they will open the emergency room right away so getting that provider number will just hold off the hospital side mostly just to add on to the question earlier someone asked why can't we just open an urgent care clinic right now is that something that has to go through all those kinds of permits and everything too you know to open a facility that's been closed takes a fair amount of capital anyway and it's probably not a practical business thing to try to do just that whereas what Dr. Kelly has done even though it's a different location hopefully that will take a lot of the overflow I'll just real quick the because the city and county of Honolulu provides ambulance services in a contract with the state the state of Hawaii does all the billing for any of the county's EMS services so even though you call a city ambulance the bill will come from the state and some years ago they did have contracts with different insurance companies but my understanding of that and this was before I took my current position is that it was seen as unfair that maybe somebody with one insurance would get a cheaper rate than somebody with another insurance and so they got rid of the contracts all across the board so kind of everybody was on a even playing field whether you had Kaiser HMSA no insurance TRICARE or what have you well with that I want to thank everyone for coming today especially our panelists who as you can see a lot of they have been a lot for us to make sure we have great medical care and mahalo for everyone attending mahalo for coming